The following program is a production of Pioneer Public Television. Meet the Candidates is brought to you by Pioneer Public Television. The next hour is intended to encourage, debate, and educate you, the viewer, about the candidates running for office. The end result is for voters to be able to make an informed decision on Election Day. Participate in the process by sending in your questions now. The candidates for Minnesota State House District 8B are Jay Sealing, a DFLer from Alexandria, and Mary Franson, a Republican, also from Alexandria. Welcome back to Pioneer Public Television's Meet the Candidates. I'm the moderator for your program, Amy Dahl Wallers. The goal of this program is to give you an opportunity to meet your ca candidates and also to ask some questions, hopefully to also encourage you to vote on November 4th. Uh, please be aware that we will not be having an 8 o'clock meet the candidates tonight. The candidates tonight are from House District 8B, and let's briefly meet those candidates. We have Joe Sealing. Joe is... Jay. The, I'm sorry, Jay. Thank Anybody's going to do that. Jay Sealing. Jay is the Democrat from Alexandria. Welcome, Jay. Thank you. And Mary Franson. Mary is a Republican, also from Alexandria. Welcome, Mary. Now we're going to take a look at House District 8B map so that you can determine whether or not this is the district that you'll be voting in and whether or not these are the candidates that you should be watching. So please pay attention during uh, this brief uh, intermission. Minnesota State House District 8B includes most of the eastern half of Ottertail County and the northeast corner of Douglas County. Cities in this district include Alexandria, Osakis, and Ottertail, to name a few. If this is your district, please make sure you call in now with your questions at 1-800-726-3178. You'll have another opportunity uh, in a few minutes, too, after the candidates get their opening statements. Um, because of time limits, we do ask that you call in questions that can be directed towards both candidates as opposed to questions that are, are geared towards just a single candidate. So now we will begin with the three-minute opening remarks, and Jay has won the toss this evening. So, Jay, you may start with your opening remarks. Thank you. My name is Jay Sealing, and I'm running to be your representative in House District 8B. I grew up in a small farming community in southern Minnesota, and my parents were both teachers by trade and actually met on the job. When us kids came along, my mom stayed home and brought us up, brought us up well. And it wasn't always easy, raising five kids on one teacher's salary, but we made it through with hard work, studying, caring for each other, Basic rural values that I hold very, very dear. I grew up with models of servant leadership, participating in Boy Scouts, Future Farmers of America, and 4-H. Those experiences helped to develop leadership qualities in me that have served me well. After college, I became a teacher. I studied speech communication at the graduate level, and then my heart brought me back to Minnesota, and I married my college sweetheart, and it's a romance that's lasted for 26 years. We've had our humble beginnings. I worked a variety of jobs while helping her through medical school. And when our first child was born, I started the best job I've ever had, being a father. I stayed at home with our children for almost nine years. And when they were all off to school, I bought into a sporting goods store. We sold bait and tackle, hunting and camping equipment, and we bought, sold, and traded firearms. We also put up an indoor archery range, and I was a certified instructor. When the kids became more involved in school and school activities, I eventually closed the store and began teaching as an adjunct instructor at Alexandria Technical and Community College. And I've been teaching there on a full-time basis now for these last eight years. Now I'm undertaking a new calling to serve the people of Ottertail and Douglas counties. I love this area. I've been around this area my whole life. My dad grew up in Corliss Township of Ottertail County. And whether you grew up here or whether you settled here for retirement, whether you make your living here or just visit on vacation, you all know the value of this area and the value of the people of this area and how important it is to have a voice when it comes to making public policy that affects all of us. When my family moved here almost 20 years ago, we settled in the Erickson Heritage neighborhood of Alexandria. It's a wonderful neighborhood, and it's platted out on the farmstead of T.A. Dad Erickson. 
He's known as the father of 4-H in Minnesota. Learning that brought back my days of FFA and 4-H and the rural values that make up who I am. My campaign is based on those values. I want to make the best better. And so I pledge my head to clearer thinking, my heart to greater loyalty, my hands to larger service, and my health to better living for my club, my country, my community, and most of all, for the people of District 8B. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. And next we will hear from Mary Franson, the Republican candidate also from Alexandria. Mary? Thank you, Pioneer Public Television, for hosting this debate, where viewers have the chance to tune in and learn about the issues that affect our communities. I am State Representative Mary Franson, and for the past four years, I have had the complete honor of representing your conservative values in St. Paul, and it is my hope to continue serving you for another two years. Before being elected as a public servant, I owned and operated a union-free childcare business, and before that, I worked for AT&T. I grew up in rural Minnesota on an 80-acre hobby, um, hobby farm. I graduated from a rural high school, Elbrook, and received a Bachelor of, Bachelor of Arts from the University of Minnesota, Duluth. I want to thank the opponent for running. As a single mom of three, Helena being 16, Carl being nine, and Colin being seven, I know it takes a lot of personal sacrifice to run a campaign and to put yourself out there. Thank you for stepping up. I decided to seek another term because hardworking Minnesotans cannot afford another two years like the previous two years of one-party control of state government. Between higher taxes, double-digit increases in state government, and the uh, out-of-control spending, the disastrous implementation of Obamacare in Minnesota, an unprecedented effort to restrict our Second Amendment rights, I want to return to the Capitol to join a coalition of legislators to turn around what one-party Democrat control has done to our state. I am endorsed by MCCL, Minnesota Chamber, the Minnesota Gun Owners PAC, NFIB, Minnesota Republican Liberty Caucus, and the NRA. I look forward to the questions and hope you find the answers useful. Thank you, Mary. Now is your opportunity to call in 1-800-726-3178 or email your questions to yourtv at pioneer.org. Please send your questions in early. We already have several questions that have been coming in, and I think we'll probably run out of time. So send your questions in early if you want to have them asked. We will be taking a short message or short break now to listen to a message from Pioneer Public Television while our volunteers take your calls and prepare them for the candidates. Thanks for watching Meet the Candidates on Pioneer Public Television. After this short break, we will return to the question and answer portion. We encourage you to call in or send your questions by email to the studio for the candidates to address. Taking photos, to me it's almost therapy you know, for myself. I think the community likes to kind of think of it as maybe their home or something that they have too here in the town. I believe so much in the power that music has in people's lives and the fact that what I love to do can change someone's life for the better. That's all that matters to me. program like the PBS NewsHour. It's been on the air for more than three decades. The NewsHour is always going to take you deeper and take you broader. That's even more essential now than I think it ever was. 
Now, what we're able to do is to take it to the next step, to coordinate even more closely with what we're doing online. And we're finally in the position where we can expand our franchise to the weekend as well. PBS NewsHour Weekend is kind of a natural evolution for the Monday to Friday program. The world is more complicated than it's ever been. People have more access to sources of news than they've ever had. And what the news hour does is it tells you not only what happened that day, but digs a little deeper. Night after night, seven days a week, we're consistently different than what the audiences get on broadcast television. There has to be a destination where you can get the information and it's still going to take you someplace you didn't even know you wanted to go. That's the news hour. What if TV respected children? They long to know that they're loved. And taught children respect. Who says everybody can't master French cooking? Bon appétit! Why can't TV encourage millions of preschoolers to learn? All of us to wonder. And a nation to experience history as it was lived. The green shall never die. And what if great art flowed into every living room freely? Give to your PBS station and support the people and programs that never stop asking. What if? Am I ever glad to be in this neighborhood? We return now to our question and answer portion of the program. We encourage you to become involved by sending in your questions by phone or email. Welcome back, and let's get into the questions now. The first question will go to Mary. It's about the safety of our food supply, and the question is, what would you do to assure that the food we eat is safe and healthy? Um, thank you for that question. And as a mother of three, it is important that we have good food. Um, but I believe that our farmers are doing uh, the right thing right now, and I don't really see any more legislation that is needed. Okay. Food safety is, is very, very important. And I, I agree with, with Mary that uh, I think our farmers do a, a wonderful job. Uh, I think it's very important that uh, we know exactly where our food comes from. Um, there is a, a lot of talk and uh, there is a lot of uh, angst over what other items are in our food. Um, are they genetically modified organisms? Uh, are there things that are going to be causing uh, allergies uh, or other reactions uh, that, that we ingest? And we should know where those kinds of things come from. Uh, there have been a couple of uh, different um, legislations that have, that have uh, tried to address this. Uh, I, I think this is something that uh, needs to be looked at at a national level so that each state does not have its own hodgepodge of, of regulations uh, regarding labeling for, for food safety. Uh, I think the FDA has a, a good handle on things and I think our, our farmers uh, produce some of the best food around. And I think Minnesota continue to be a leader in uh, agricultural policy and in this regard of, of, of food safety I think this is something that uh, Minnesota can be somebody that we can look to again and make sure that uh, the food that we are consuming is of the best quality. Thank you. All right, Jay, the next question for you. What is your opinion on how Minsure has affected, either positively or negatively, the targeted market? Minsure is a, is a hot, hot button topic. Um, and I think we hear a lot of the negative uh, because of the difficulty in the rollout, uh, because of the, um, the, the, the spike that we're seeing in, in some of the health care costs and in some of the insurance rates. Um, Minsure itself was a, a marketplace to go and find insurance. Uh, the Affordable Care Act mandates that we should all carry insurance. Uh, that's the positive thing of ever having more people covered is that more people pay attention to their health care needs. We have more attention to uh, basic primary care and that keeps people healthier. That keeps people from waiting until the last minute and for a catastrophe and ending up in the emergency room. Uh, the average emergency room visit is over $1,200. That's where the real expenses are. 
And when people go to the emergency room uh, because they can't afford uh, basic coverage and they haven't been able to keep up with primary care, that's what really drives up health care costs. Uh, the American Hospitalists Association uh, put out a, a report that said um, care that has gone unpaid for through emergency rooms uh, nationwide topped $41 billion. And that's what really drives up uh, the costs. Uh, Mincher had a very, very tough rollout. Um, but because of the Affordable Care Act and, and Mincher, we have over 300,000 people that now have coverage that didn't have it before. Minnesota had and, and, and continues to lead. They've been a leader in health care and continues to lead. Uh, but our uh, uninsured rate dropped. Um, we are amongst the lowest in the nation. And the health care rates that are available on Minsher still continue to lead and uh, be the lowest in the nation. Thank you. Mary? Uh, yes, thank you so much for that. Um, Obamacare was passed without one single Republican vote on the national level. It was also passed without one single vote of Republicans on the state level. Minnesota had the best health care in the country. We had the lowest rates the lowest uninsured rates, and the highest quality. We took care of people with pre-existing incomes and low um, pre-existing conditions and low incomes. Obamacare destroyed the great work that Minnesota has done. Um, Obamacare, or Minsure, the state's version of Obamacare, has not lived up to its promises. We were told premiums would drop by 30 percent. We were told that we would keep um, our personal information would be kept secure, and that uh, did not happen. Within uh, weeks, uh, Social Security uh, numbers were leaked. Uh, we were told we'd be able to keep our doctor. Many doctor or many constituents in the area have not been able to keep their doctor of choice. None of the promises have been kept. Currently, the legislative auditor is conducting an audit of um, Obamacare in Minnesota that will be completed by the end of the year. This report will give the legislature an understanding of where to fix the problems, but it is my opinion that those problems will never be fixed. Minnesota, you, the taxpayers, spent $160 million for a website that has been broken. It has provided major hassles to people trying to get health care coverage. And while Minnesotans were trying to get coverage through the broken website, Minsure executives got thousands of your tax dollars in taxpayer-funded bonuses and we can do better. Who are you going to send to St. Paul to fix Obamacare? Is it going to be somebody who destroyed and is part of the party that destroyed our health care? Or are you going to um, send somebody that will advocate for reforms such as allowing small businesses to pool together to provide coverage? Thank you. Next question, Mary. How could our health care system be improved so that all people have access to affordable quality care? Well, I will continue on with the question uh, from previously that I was giving my answer to. So some of the reforms that we could enact would be allowing small businesses to pull together to purchase health insurance to lower risks and reduce co um, insurance costs, uh, advocate for mal medical uh, malpractice reform, as well as health savings accounts. I am going to continue, such as I have done for the last four years, um, advocating for patient-centered health care, not government-run health care. Thank you. Jay? I, I think we've got good patient-centered uh, health care now. Um, my wife is a, a primary care provider. I, I see the, uh, the kinds of care and, and how she deals with patients every single day. Minnesota does lead with this. And I, I champion and, and would listen to all ideas to try and make things even better. Uh, but there are some good things happening. Is it perfect? Um, a lot of opinions would say, would say no. Can we do better? Let's do better. Let's make the best better. Um, I'm the kind of person that wants to go to St. Paul uh, to be able to listen to that. I'm not tied to the, the party that broke things. I wasn't there yet. Uh, but I definitely want to have a part in making sure that we continue to lead and provide the best health care available. Uh, it is patient-centered. One of the things that, that the Affordable Care Act does is make sure that uh, we have access to our medical records and that patients have access to those and that those, access, that those records are shared with the patient and become portable so they aren't just held in, in, in one location. Uh, 
Um, there are good things happening uh, with the Affordable Care Act. There are good things happening and can happen with Minsure if we pay attention and fix what needs to be fixed. Thank you. Would you like a rebuttal, Mayor? Yeah. <coughs> uh, yes. Uh, just the other day, I spoke to a 20-year-old who has a girlfriend um, who works in the disability community. And that uh, person is not going to carry health care, um, have health coverage any longer because this individual cannot afford the health care premiums. So uh, that uh, is a concern because Minsure, supposedly Obamacare, was supposed to fix that problem of not having health care coverage. Instead, it's made it a lot more expensive. So people are choosing to either pay the penalty or decide whether or not they're going to uh, put their children in for sports. They're going to take them out of sports in order to pay um, uh, higher health care premiums. Uh, so this is conversations taking all, of, uh, all across the district. Jay, would you like to say something? Yeah. Um, it's not a simple matter of, of just taking the penalty. Um, Minsure is a marketplace that is also tied to uh, federal subsidies to help make that more affordable. And if somebody is, is unable to afford the premiums, <laughs> they're probably going to qualify for those subsidies. Uh, even if they don't, um, the risk and the eventual cost of simply taking the penalty is going to be catastrophic, and that's exactly what runs up our health care costs. Average cost of a ER visit, $1,200. If this person that just takes the uh, penalty then ends up with influenza, uh, ends up with uh, a kidney stone, that could be $3,000. And who pays for it then? We pay for that. Other people that are insured pays for that. That's why costs keep going up. So we need to encourage people to enroll and be responsible and be covered. And there's lots of opportunities for that. Thank you. Jay, with some nursing homes in our area closing and the rest working on shoestring budgets and with our population aging, what would you do to ensure that enough quality nursing home care is available in our rural communities. This is a looming problem and I think this is going to be one of the top issues we'll be facing in the legislature next year. Uh, we've already seen uh, in our area a couple nursing homes close and another one that has reduced the number of beds and the number of services. Um, everybody agrees that this is something that needs uh, great attention uh, and it's a, it's a, a problem that's not going to go away. Uh, we have a looming age wave uh, with a number of baby boomers that are going to be coming in and going to be needing those services. So we're going to have to look and find ways uh, to be efficient, uh, to prioritize our budgets, and to fix this uh, permanently and going forward um, to make sure that this isn't a, a one-time fix, uh, that this is a, a structural issue. We're going to have to look and, and find some dedicated funding for nursing homes. And that's going to, again, be something that's going to have to be creative to uh, see if some of the taxes that nursing homes pay already are into a dedicated pool that will come back to nursing care, um, to find ways of uh, utilizing technology so people can stay in their homes longer and, and look at other ways of affording care. And we also need to make sure that we uh, attract and retain good qualified uh, and quality providers in those areas. Uh, from CNAs to LPNs to RNs, we've got to make that uh, an attractive position. It's a skilled position, and there's going to be a gap if we can't fund those properly and attract people to have those jobs. So we should work with our schools, we should work with our technical programs to make sure that we're uh, training people for those positions and coming up with the funding to make sure that those positions are rewarded and people continue that work and can continue the service for the coming age wave. Thank you. Mary? Nursing care is not a uh, partisan issue, or at least it should not be. So I'm actually going to agree with the opponent on what he had to say about our nursing home. It certainly is an issue that is facing greater Minnesota. Um, it is affecting the fact that uh, we can't get our people that are on a waiting list trying to get into nursing care and struggling to find a bed. Uh, we've got uh, a shortage of workers and lack of funding to make sure that we can retain a qualified workforce and to provide the care that our elderly deserve. Um, I, I believe that every grandmother and grandfather out there uh, deserves proper care um, at their end of life. Um, there was one party control 
in the last legislative session. The one party control that raised $2.1 billion worth of new taxes. I did um, author a legislation that provided for a 5% rate increase for nursing homes that passed the House. Unfortunately, when that uh, went to conference committee, it was not adopted into that bill. And that was, um, I thought that was very partisan. When the party in control passed uh, $90 million of your tax dollars to fund a brand new Senate office building for a part-time legislature. And I thought that was a pretty much a slap in the face, not only to our nursing homes, but also to our disability community. Thank you. I agree, this is not a partisan issue. And, and so I think bringing up the, uh, the, the one party and, and the Senate office building in this part of the discussion, is ma you're making it partisan. Um, you did put forth the 5% um, increase a as that amendment, and it, it passed overwhelmingly. It was 100 to 28. It was passed on April 3rd. Hours later, on the floor vote for that same bill, you voted no. Then it went to conference committee, and what came back from conference committee, you didn't even uh, register a vote. Um, this kind of a, a situation is a nonpartisan and really needs to have uh, a nonpartisan solution. We need to reach across the aisle and cooperate and, and make, this, uh, make this solution happen. Mary, would you like a rebuttal? Uh, yes, I just want to remind uh, the opponent there that wasteful spending is wasteful, wasteful spending. And so that $90 million Senate office building did make this whole legislative issue, um, session very partisan because um, $90 million of your tax dollars went to pay for a new Senate office building, and that $90 million could have been spent elsewhere. $2.1 billion worth of new taxes. And, um, yeah, I voted against the, the conference committee report and that bill because the Senate, um, or, sorry, the House uh, did not have uh, the nursing home funding in that bill. Thank you. Mary, what do you think the legislature should do to make post-secondary education more affordable? notes here. Um, great question. Uh, there was a tuition freeze enacted in 2013. In order to get the tuition freeze, taxpayers in 2013 um, legislative session invested $150 million of your tax dollars in higher education to buy down that freeze. While a freeze sounds great, it is a feel-good talking point, not a real solution. We need to get to the heart of why higher education is so expensive. Alexandria Technical College is a beacon for the entire nation and serves as a great example of what we are doing right, right here in District 8B. Let's bring those good decisions to St. Paul to reform higher education spending. Thank you. Jay? We're going to find several points where we agree. And again, I, I agree with my opponent, ATCC, Alexandria Technical and Community College is a beacon uh, not only in our district, but uh, statewide. Uh, and I'm very proud to be associated with that organization. Um, higher education, uh, and, and education as a whole, but particularly higher education, has seen uh, about a decade of, of disinvestment. I started teaching at Alexandria Technical and Community College in the fall of 2006. And at that point, um, the state appropriations were still just ahead of, um, of what tuition costs. Within two years, it was 50-50. Um, now we're at a point where almost 60% of our budget is covered by tuition and 40% by uh, the state appropriations. Uh, what we've seen with that reinvestment of $150 million, that, that ability to, to freeze tuition, is a, uh, a reversal of that disinvestment that's happened over the last decade. Um, as my opponent said a moment ago, wasteful spending is wasteful spending. Um, but I, I think we look at, at spending and, and see what we get out of it. Um, that's what really, really makes a difference. I wasn't there uh, for the Senate office building uh, debate. I, I don't think I would have voted for it. But I look at what's happening now. It's a $77 million building and a $13 million parking ramp that will be paid for by service fees. It was bonded for, so it's being paid back over time. Um, there's other, other wasteful spending, $500 million for a Viking stadium that I wouldn't have agreed with. And three years ago, your, your, my appoint, opponent was part of a, a system that shut down the government that cost us over $65 million. And with that, we have nothing to show for it. Mary, would you like a rebuttal? Actually, 
Um, the, tack, the shutdown that the opponent has so eloquently pointed to, all that did, um, we, uh, the governor shut down the, Senate, or the, the entire state of Minnesota because he did not get his $2.1 billion worth of new taxes. Well, we can see what that has done now. Um, back to education, though. Uh, a report by the Wall Street Journal in late 2012 showed that hiring for administrators was nearly twice as fast as the growth in the student body. We should be tying accountability measures and reforms for college administration when making funding decisions for higher education. Thank you, Jay. Would you like to add? Look what we have done. Um, we've been able to freeze tuition for two years. We've been able to uh, invest in education, even early education, early childhood education, all day kindergarten. Um, Minnesota has been performing better economically throughout the recession precisely because of our attention to education. Uh, Alexandria Technical and Community College uh, has a 90% placement rate. Uh, their graduates are finding work-related uh, positions almost immediately. We have some, uh, some of our programs that are the, the graduates are, are hired up before they're even, even through with school. We can't keep up. So there are good things happening with those investments in education. And I think we need to have attention to make sure we make those efficient so we can continue that and keep college affordable. Thank you. Jay, what legislation would you support to further protect our most precious resources, air and water? Those are very much two of our most important resources. Um, Minnesota is a water-rich state. And clean air and clean water is one of the things that, uh, that attracts people, that attracts uh, human capital, and uh, makes this a wonderful, wonderful place to live. Uh, I, I think there are a number of things that uh, we need to, to pay attention to. Uh, the, the original Clean Water Act was passed back in the 70s with the goal to make all waters uh, fishable and swimmable by a, a certain date in the late 70s, early 80s. Um, we didn't quite accomplish it in that time frame, but we keep our eye on that uh, kind of legislation and uh, the honorable principles that, uh, that make us seek after, after clean water. So I would look for um, legislation and, and champion legislation that protects our, our clean water, um, that protects our, our clean air, um, makes it uh, easier to, to breathe. Um, those are all very closely connected to uh, our, our healthy living. Uh, Minnesota, again, leads in the, uh, the, the nation for being a place of, of healthy living. So I am uh, very much interested in and, and would champion uh, endeavors that would uh, protect our clean water resources and keep our air clean and breathable. Thank you. Mary? Clean water and clean air are obviously very important to me. Uh, the LCCMR Bill, HF 1874, the final recommendations of the Citizen, uh, Legislative Citizen Commission uh, on Minnesota Resources included $1.3 million for aquatic invasive species prevention projects, $963,000 for terrestrial invasive species prevention projects, $900,000 for two studies rega regarding the declining moose population, and overall um, $4.5 million related to water resources. I voted yes to support the citizen group recommendations for protection of our clean lakes and streams, and I'm going to continue supporting efforts to keep our, our water clean and our air clean. Thank you. Mary, roads and bridges are in need of repair. Do you support increased revenue to, ad to address these needs? We certainly have some significant transportation needs in Minnesota. And it's clear to most, um, to most of us here that our roads and bridges need more attention. But what we need are roads, not rails. Choo-choo trains in St. Paul are a waste of your tax dollars. Uh, we certainly should look at some additional revenue. However, before considering another tax increase, we should look for other funding mechanisms. After the last gas tax went into effect, the Minnesota Department of Transportation agreed that it would find 15% efficiencies within its budget to help fund transportation projects. We should ask that if they, um, that they hold up their end of the bargain before looking at a tax increase. Our funding priorities should be on roads, bridges, and bus transportation. Light rail transit has not been proven to be an effective use of taxpayer dollars. 
Uh, and another thing about that is that um, Greater Minnesota is constantly trying to fight for our fair share of funding from the Metro when we here are subsidizing for the, the upkeep of the light rail and mass transit in uh, the Metro. Thank you. Jay? This is another issue that's going to be at the forefront of the next session and I would very much want to be a voice in, in part of that discussion. Uh, we do need attention here in, in rural Minnesota. The way we move things, the way we move people here are our roads and our bridges. Uh, and it's very important that those are maintained. It's a public safety issue. Uh, and it's a commerce issue. It's an economy issue to be able to move goods and, and transport people. Um, so we do need to find a way to maintain those, those roads and, and bridges. Uh, finding efficiencies and making sure that, uh, that, that current revenue is spent appropriately uh, goes a, a, a great deal of the way toward that. Um, but if that's not going to be enough, we're going to have to find dedicated sources of revenue or find ways to be able to target revenue for specific projects. Uh, we need to be able to work cooperatively, to be able to work with uh, state, local, county governments and also leverage federal dollars wherever possible. Um, the, the federal dollars are one of the things that have made the light rail in, in the Twin Cities um, begin to work. Um, it, it's, it's easy to, to point at uh, the choo-choo trains and, and claim they aren't uh, of much benefit. Uh, but if part of the goal of transportation is making it efficient and reducing congestion, I'd say those things are beginning to work. Uh, ridership in the Green Line uh, has reached the capacity of what they were anticipating in 2030, so 15 years ahead of time. In the Blue Line, it reached that capacity uh, within 18 months. Uh, and so they've also um, increased their revenue through um, insurance, uh, or not, not through insurance, but through advertising. So their advertising um, revenue uh, has exceeded their expectations. Uh, and so those things are becoming uh, self-sufficient and people are using them. We're seeing millions of people using those trains and it's easing congestion. Now let's turn the attention to outstate and make sure that our bridges are up to speed and that our roads are in well, well condition. Thank you, Mary. Would you like a rebuttal? Uh, it sounds like my opponent there is trying to run for a house seat in the metro and not 8B, which uh, is in the rural Minnesota. Um, Democrats were so concerned with roads and bridges that they spent more money on that Senate office building than they did on roads and bridges. Jay, would you like a rebuttal? Yeah, I, I am running for 8B. I love it here, uh, but I travel to the cities. And I've used the trains. I traveled uh, from Big Lake uh, all the way down uh, to the Twin Cities. I took in a Twins game. Uh, my son uh, goes to school in St. Louis and loves having public transportation in a large city. It gets him around. But when he flew home for Thanksgiving, he takes the train, and I don't have to drive all the way to the metro area. I can stay in outstate Minnesota. I can pick him up in Big Lake. So there are positive things that are happening. It's happened, and it was leveraged by federal dollars. There's some good things. Good things are happening in Minnesota, and I want to make sure that they keep continuing to happen, especially in the outstate, and I will be a voice for that. Thank you. Jay, what legislation would you support to improve broadband to communities in rural Minnesota? This is a very, very important issue to me. Um, I, I teach a class at Alexandria Technical and Community College called Technology Ethics, and one of the things we look at is the uh, availability and the accessibility of high-speed internet. Uh, the last session, uh, they came out with a $20 million uh, pool of money uh, for grants to be able to have companies access to improve rural broadband. Uh, we're in an increasingly global society, and we have so much that depends on our connectivity, uh, whether it is for, for businesses, uh, for uh, uh, health, uh, telehealth, uh, possibilities. Uh, even education is, is enhanced and can, can be uh, greatly provided more access through rural broadband. I would like to see that program uh, even expanded uh, and make use of it. And This has to be done cooperatively. This has got to be a, pro a public and private investment. We're starting to see this happen. Um, the city of Bemidji will soon have one gigabit service and that's made possible through their Paul Bunyan co-op and the investments that they are making to put fiber to every household. Um, we can't lag behind on this. Um, nationwide, um, Minnesota tends to be a leader 
And on this issue, we're, we're slowing down a little bit, uh, we're almost as slow as, as our internet service is. So we need to step that up and continue to be a leader both in that technology and that accessibility. Because there's so many wonderful things that can continue to happen in rural Minnesota. As I said, education, uh, telehealth, commerce, all of that depends on that accessibility. That's going to attract jobs, that's going to attract businesses, uh, and that's just going to increase our human capital and make us the best state in the nation. Thank you. Mary? I guess. Um, Minnesota uh, just passed at the last legislative session uh, $20 million for broadband to partner with um, for our local areas to uh, dig into in order to expand uh, broadband. And I certainly support those efforts and want greater Minnesota to be just as competitive than um, with the metro. Jay, would you like to rebuttal? It's, it's, it's easy to support that, um, but that bill, again, was, was part of that omnibus supplemental appropriations, and, and you voted against it. Uh, and, and I know it's, it's a complicated issue because there's a lot of things in, in those bills, um, but a lot of people just look at, that, look at that final vote. And we agree that this is, this is hugely important in the rural area uh, because it's frustrating uh, lagging behind. And I think we need to increase that. And, and again, it's got to be done cooperatively. We have got wonderful co-ops that are, are connecting and providing this kind of service. Uh, in our area, Gardenville uh, Telephone Co-op uh, has, has had great uh, service and been able to connect and work with Knut Nelson and their Grand Care program. And that's an example of that telehealth kind of service that can enhance uh, elder care, um, and that can enhance education, and can really put our rural areas back on the map and make Minnesota a leader again. Mary, would you like a rebuttal? Uh, yes. Uh, so the opponent makes a lot of comments about investing in Minnesota. Um, investing means spending. I was sent down to St. Paul to be a steward of your tax dollars. And when bills fall into supplemental budget bills or, or tax bills or other spending bills, that um, have other projects in there that I believe that are not a good use of your tax dollars, I have to make that decision of whether or not this is going to be good on your wallets. And that last, uh, when the Democrats were in control, the majority of their spending was not appropriate for your wallet and therefore is why I voted no. Thank you. Mary, what is your stance on the current gun laws in the state, such as registering and licensing fi firearms? I was endorsed by the NRA and also by Minnesota um, Go Pack. I certainly will not nor ever support registering your, um, your guns or licensing, and I certainly will never ever limit in any way, shape, or form your Second Amendment rights. Thank you. Jay? This is another area of agreement. Um, I had a sporting goods business. I was a licensed federal firearms dealer, a corporate member of the NRA. I'm a now a, a an individual member of the NRA. Uh, I bought, sold, and traded guns for almost five years. Um, I operated that business on, on both sides of uh, Minnesota's conceal and carry law. Uh, I'm a conceal carry permit holder myself. Uh, I operated that business on both sides of the Brady Bill. I understand those issues. Uh, I also champion Second Amendment rights, and I'm not looking to go to St. Paul to take away anybody's guns. Uh, I, I find that a, a ridiculous kind of argument. Uh, and I, I certainly would not allow anything like that to come out of committee uh, and, and would not support those kinds of bills. Um, there are some common sense measures that uh, we do uh, look at and need to look at closely and that we do support. And I know that my opponents supported a uh, new law that just went into effect in, in August. Uh, that restricts the, the gun rights for those that are convicted of domestic abuse. And I think that was uh, almost passed unanimously, and uh, even gun rights groups uh, were in favor of that kind of legislation. And that's what can happen when we listen to each other and don't label each other. Thank you. Mary, would you like a rebuttal? Uh, yes. Mr. S um, the opponent here tells you that he respects the Second Amendment. I think he might disagree. According to the opponent's own responses to gun rights group surveys, he supports universal registration of any firearm, banning common sporting rifles such as the AR-15, which is a common sport rifle, government monitoring of your ammunition purchases, and requiring you to pay a transfer fee when you loan your gun to a friend. He opposes securing your right to keep and bear arms in the Minnesota Constitution, 
legalizing suppressors, which is a common safety device, also removing the fees and red tape incurred to exercise your right to carry, the constitutional carry. Mr. Uh, or the opponent's status as a former firearms dealer has no bearing on his willingness to defend your Second Amendment rights. Would you like to move on? Yeah, um, my, my statements are out there. Um, you, you can read them. I oppose registration. Well, the first three words that I said, I oppose registration. Because uh, quite frankly, I, I can't see how they can done, be done bureaucratically. And, and for the same reason, I don't want every single state to have different regulations. Uh, as for constitutional carry, um, that I, I think is uh, could a potential slippery slope, depending on how that kind of legislation would be put together. Again, I'm somebody that wants to listen and look very closely at issues. We already have concealed carry available in Minnesota. It's not difficult to do. It's not an, an overly burdensome hurdle to get to. And as for enshrining uh, the right to bear arms in the Minnesota Constitution, it's already enshrined in our federal constitution. And that supersedes states. Thank you. Jay, what are your thoughts on medicinal cannabis? This was a, a, an issue that uh, came through legislation last year, and, and I watched it very closely. Um, and and I've, I've been looking at uh, the laws in uh, states that have passed it previously. As I think we can learn a lot uh, about uh, those issues that have already gone, gone through. Um, it's going to take a while for this to get up and running, um, but I looked at and I listened to those people that, that came to the Capitol, and uh, it has a place um, if it can, uh, if it can um, help people that are, are suffering from uh, uh, certain issues, from uh, cancer, uh, seizure disorders. Um, the science is showing that there is uh, a benefit for medical cannabis. So I think it's important that, uh, that we acknowledge that, to be able to help those people in Minnesota that can uh, benefit from those uses. And I think it's uh, something that, uh, that we need to keep studying and make sure that we put forth the, the best legislation that will help the most people and do it in an efficient way. Um, it's something that uh, if, it's, if it's done to help somebody that's truly suffering, it shouldn't be criminal. And I think that's why the, the state legislature took that step um, and, and uh, went ahead with this uh, medical cannabis bill. Thank you. Mary? I voted against the medical cannabis bill, and uh, if this comes back up to legalize marijuana in the state of Minnesota for recreational use, I will also vote no against that. Thank you. Jay, would you like a rebuttal? Yeah, I, I know that seems to be where the, the next step is. Um, there's, you know, a, a, as a plant, there are all sorts of things that, uh, that marijuana or hemp or cannabis can, can be used for. There's an industrial version that could be beneficial. Uh, and I know my, my opponent uh, had, had looked at, at some of that legislation. When it's THC free, there's, there's things that, uh, that can be good about it. Uh, as a public speaking teacher, I've had countless students uh, give an argument uh, to try and do a persuasive speech on the benefits of legalizing marijuana. I have really not been convinced yet, um, and, and if that comes up in this next session, uh, it's going to take uh, many, many more speeches before I would be convinced. Thank you. I think we're almost out of time, but um, Mary, I will bring the next question to you. What are your top priorities if you are reelected? Uh, yes, I'm going to continue working um, for our child care providers as a former child care provider. I know the ins and outs of that business. And so I'm going to continue advocating for our child care providers. As you know, I have been the lead person against that whole unionization of child care providers. Uh, it was a very partisan, partisan, um, destructive thing that has affected those uh, bin businesses. And over the past couple of years, we have lost thousands of uh, providers because of those regulations uh, and the unionizing efforts. I'm going to advocate for our, our nursing homes and I'm also going to advocate for our disability folks uh, as well as our unborn. So there's a lot of work to do and I will be putting up uh, my sleeves and working for you as soon as we get back into session in January. Thank you. Jay? I think we share some admirable goals because we both have the same goal of uh, making rural Minnesota continuing 
to make Minnesota a, a, a very strong, strong place. Uh, my, my top priorities uh, as, a, as a teacher from a family of teachers and, and a lifelong history of teaching and learning, uh, education is very important uh, because it is the portal uh, that uh, helps fill our skills gap, uh, creates human capital to uh, feed that industry um, that is bringing Minnesota back economically. Um, the uh, former state economist ha has said that uh, it's our attention on education that has kept Minnesota apace uh, even through the recession, and I think that that's very important. Uh, specifically, I am very, very keen on uh, the rural broadband issue and wanting to make sure that uh, we have access to affordable, good, high-speed Internet because that's something that connects to everything. It's going to connect to jobs. It's going to connect to commerce and the economy because we can participate in a global market uh, using uh, high-speed Internet. Uh, it's going to connect to our nursing homes and our ability to provide telehealth services and remote monitoring. And it, it certainly ties back to education because we can have uh, students in rural areas in small high schools that don't have as much access to college courses can access those courses online. And all of that can be accomplished through uh, good, solid rural broadband initiatives. Uh, roads and bridges uh, are another thing that's going to take a big focus. And that's all part of that infrastructure. Uh, my top three priorities have always been education, health care, and infrastructure. And they're all related, and it's all going to come about to help make rural Minnesota uh, a leader, make Minnesota a leader in the nation. Thank you. And that is all the time we have for questions this evening. Thank you to everyone who called in. And I apologize that we couldn't get to more, but we did get through a lot of the questions. We now will move on to the two-minute closing remarks from each candidate. We will start with the Republican candidate running for House District 8B, Mary Franson. Mary? Thank you. And thanks once again to Pioneer Public Television for hosting this debate. I certainly hope you, the viewers at home, got the answers that you were looking for to these questions that were asked tonight. I also want to send uh, a thank you to Casey and his parents for helping me with the children as I um, run for re-election. I really do appreciate your support. Um, as stated earlier, I um, am seeking another term because hardworking Minnesotans cannot afford another two years of the previous, um, another two years like the previous two years of one party control of state government. Between higher taxes, double digit increases in state spending, the disastrous implementation of Obamacare in Minnesota, and an unprecedented effort to restrict our Second Amendment rights, I want to return to the Capitol to join a coalition of legislators to turn around what one party control, um, Democrat control, has done to our state. Thank you so much, and look forward to seeing you on the campaign trail. Thank you, Mary. And now for our Democratic candidate running this evening, Jay Sealing. Jay? Thank you, and thanks for hosting this. I am proud to be a Minnesotan. Minnesota is known as the North Star State. That's our state motto. As a Boy Scout, I learned that the North Star is a key marker for navigation. We look to that star for direction. It guides us on our path. It gives us a key to our journey. And our state motto is no mistake. Minnesota is a leader. CNBC ranks Minnesota as the sixth best state in which to do business. Forbes ranks Minnesota as the third best state in which to make a living. We are ranked second in the nation for our talent pipeline. These things don't happen by accident. We lead. I want to be sure that we continue to lead. And that means having a vision for the future, not just criticizing the past. It means being open to exploring ideas, not dismissing them. It means continued progress, not a return to gridlock. I embrace a cooperative spirit. Working together, we can do great things. Working together, we can care for our elders and for our children. Working together, we can care for our roads and bridges and our environment. I'm a servant leader, willing to work across the aisle and represent everyone. We can make the best better. I want to thank the viewers for watching, and I want to hear more from you. You can contact me at my website, jsealing.com. I'm ready to listen, I'm ready to lead, and I'm ready to be your representative. And I ask for your vote on November 4th. Thank you. Thank you.
And that concludes this evening's Meet the Candidates. Please make sure to tune in again next week for another good session. And uh, on behalf of Pioneer Public Television, I'd like to thank the candidates for joining us this evening. I'd like to thank all the volunteers, but most importantly, I'd like to thank you, the viewers, for participating. Remember, your voice is important. Make sure your voice is heard by voting on November 4th. Good night. Thank you for watching Meet the Candidates. We hope that you have gained useful information that will allow you to make an informed decision on Election Day. On behalf of Pioneer Public Television, thank you for watching.